You're listening to episode 47 of the Creative Strings podcast with special guest Austin Shelso. Austin transitioned from being a full-time orchestra teacher to working for himself as a performer and educator. The amount he's accomplished at such a young age is really incredible. And he shares in our interview about so many things, like the innovations that he made as a classroom teacher, how he's balanced his competing desires to be a teacher and performer, the transition from working for a school to working for himself now, and how he's taken on so many different musical goals. I know you're going to love this episode with Austin Shelzo. Hello. And welcome to the Creative Strings Podcast. I'm Christian Howes, violinist, educator, and music business entrepreneur. I hope these interviews will inspire you to be creative in your life, in your art, in your business, in every way. So without further ado, let's get to it. Austin, thanks very much for doing this interview with the Creative Strings podcast. Um, part of the reason I want to bring you on is because I feel like you're really like the new generation of teachers and artists in our string playing community. Um, you've done so much just even at in like your mid twenties. <laughs> um, and so what I guess I want to start with, because you spent, I think several years teaching in classrooms in Connecticut and part of what you had asked me about you had these really ambitious ideas like about improving the standards teaching different objectives getting the community involved getting parents more involved getting students more engaged um and you've done all that over the last few years and I kind of wanted to just ask you just to talk about that, you know, how many years were you teaching in classrooms before transitioning recently to being a full-time independent teacher, private teacher, performer, and online and all these other things. But what was your journey like in the last five, six years? And from that, what would you want to give to other teachers? Sure. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, I have been in the classroom for the past four years, right after receiving my undergraduate degree in music education. I received a really amazing position in Darien, Connecticut, teaching sixth through eighth grade middle school strings. And I really enjoyed that that position. And a lot of the the things that you mentioned, I was inspired by, actually a lot of it was inspired by your partner Evan's classes on vision on having a really evocative vision for how you want to live your life. I attended one of those workshops and it and I just thought of my career as a teacher and how I could be living my best life and and be most engaged in my teaching and be as effective as a teacher that I could be. And I created a, a vision and expanded on the vision that I already had. I made it as vivid as possible and that sort of led me to to do some of these things that you mentioned. My my main overarching vision from the start of teaching public school was to create in my students a lifelong, not just appreciation for, but also participation in music. And so this is one that, you know, wouldn't stop at after high school orchestra or high school band, you know, and and that meant giving kids more a broader exposure to music and, and, and ways of thinking about music that included non-classical styles. You know, if, if this lifetime participation in music was the goal, then I had to give students more options than just playing in, say, the community orchestra or becoming a classical soloist or performer. I wanted all of my students to leave class, the three years that I had with them, to leave the class feeling just as comfortable playing, you know, around a campfire or with singer-songwriters or an acoustic band or plugging in or using a microphone in a jazz or rock setting, you know, or playing in any of these awesome fiddle traditions we have, you know, Irish and Scottish and old time and bluegrass music all requires a very different way of thinking about and interacting with music. And so that required them to learn different skills than than what is traditionally the focus, which is just uh, traditional notation, which is something that 
my students are learning in conjunction with the skills that allow them to communicate with some musicians outside of the classical you know styles you know that meant they're learning how to arrange they're learning how to improvise they're learning how to listen listening is huge in in my teaching really all this stuff these great skills that you want to teach kids has to start with a love of music it has to start with a spark and i realized over time that my role as a, their teacher during that time especially in middle school was primarily as a motivator a motivator to develop us to, to create a spark for those students and once you create that spark then they're going to be into all this stuff that, that then they're they'll naturally want to take out their instrument they'll naturally be more engaged in whatever you're teaching with and so the ways that i did that is by telling authentic stories of either my personal life or my ex musical experiences or, or performing for them you know and taking that when i'm exposing them to a new style of music taking that beginning exposure really seriously as well and i also sent these stories through email which is a big part of of kind of my growth as a teacher in the past couple of years every time i told a story that resonated maybe off the cusp or if i planned on it i would also email it and then I learned that in addition to emailing it, every time I sent an email story that received a couple of comments, I would add that to my blog. And I did this because I have new students and new parents every year. And a lot of these stories that are valuable to my students and their parents, I had upcoming students and parents who are looking to see who's the sixth grade middle school teacher. And what do they do? They find my website on Darien Public Schools. They they look through my blog they look through my resources and bam that's where i have who am i is it what's my teaching philosophy here's how to overcome you know anxiety and stress in music here's ways i think about reading music here's ways i think about listening to music and learning music by ear all that is embedded all these emails are are put into blog format you know and all these resources and videos and things they're all there and, and that's something i'm sure we'll get into more later this idea of a content library which i think is uh really helpful for teachers and even musicians to have to to be organized around that yeah i realized that the the emails that i was sending were the most effective way of getting students and parents alike more engaged so i sent i sent emails to my students too right you know sixth seventh eighth graders and they're responding they're they're getting back to me you know i have these emails right. with with pictures of their classes i have embedded videos so i would take a video in class of of this you know one tune that the eighth graders are learning and send it to the sixth graders or whatever and <laughs> and those are just you know hyperlinked i use google photos where you just share the link i would take a picture from the video so in the you know, it's kind of it grabs your attention in the email. You see the picture, you click the picture, it plays the video. They get to hear each other. That was really motivating. That's the only way the kids outside of a concert setting would learn what the other grades are doing. And so that was a big part of, of engaging students and parents as well, getting parents to see what is my kid doing on a day to day basis in orchestra class, especially if you're if you are thinking about these things beyond just the twice a year concert then this email is the only way that parents figure out what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I think more more um, teachers or school programs are catching on to that more email is better. <laughs> I remember talking with you about this like maybe a year, maybe two years ago. And, um, <clears throat> you know, do you think at first you were skeptical about sending emails to parents, sending emails to students? Yeah. Um, would you understand why other people would feel skeptical about sending too many emails? Sure. How did that evolve for you? Yeah, I think my skepticism came from, well, a few things. One, just thinking that they're going to be too, the students and the parents, they're too busy to, to answer, you know. And I, and I also thought that I have so many other important things to do as a teacher. I don't have time for that. But what changed for me is I realized instead of nagging my students to go practice or nagging my students to do this assignment or that assignment, if I had every week an inspirational story, every, the behavior in class changes, the the amount of homework, you know, practice submissions, if I wanted them to buy in and believe what I'm telling them to, to work on is important, 
then I, I, I realized that this is the real time saver is actually doing the communication. And, and again, this, that comes back to seeing my role as a motivator. Right. And so these stories and the ease of access to materials and, you know, hyperlinks, embedded links and having email signatures with all these things that, that right. prevent students from doing what they need to do, like tuning. How many, you know, parents have no idea how to tune their instrument, you know, their kid's instrument and the kids don't know how to do it and they don't know how to find it. They don't know how to find the trusted resource. So they don't do their work because of that. There's a ton of reasons that, that kids, you know, might not do what you're asking them to do. And I realized that with these motivational stories and the structure that you can put around emails, that's where my, my mind around emailing changed. Right. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir. And, um, you know, uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago, when the online thing became necessary, you know, I was yelling a lot about um, all these online teaching strategies. And there was a lot of pushback from a lot of teachers who said literally, you know, we're already being underpaid, you know, and now you want us to send emails. Now you want us to make a content library. Now you want us to, you know, uh, teach on Zoom, um, you know, and um, you, now you want us to teach all these standards. So I think that's part of why I'm interested in hearing your perspective, because I think most people think that, well, this is just more and it's too much to do and teachers are already overworked. But what I hear from you is that these um, things actually made teaching easier. So sending emails, making content library, it made your life easier and enabled you to, to get more of the results, specifically around per parent involvement, student engagement, uh, you know. Um, and I guess one of the main, I guess, so even if we, if we, if we put that aside and say, you know, we get listeners here to, to consider you know, just very explicitly, Austin's saying if you if you send emails and if you make a content library, your life's going to be easier. <laughs> You're going to get more of these results, right? So I think that's huge. But what about teaching all these standards that are different? I love how you said um, that you you know you are the sole music provider in their life. It's not just about orchestra, it's about music. And that's kind of why you want to be broader with those kids and not as narrow as traditional orchestra teaching. Um, and also that you have this this vision of um, giving them lifetime participation. I thousand percent disagree. But what about the blocks that many classical teachers are going to feel around learning, feeling like, oh, it's too many things to learn. How am I going to teach improvisation? How am I going to teach fiddle styles? How am I going to teach uh, uh, overdub to acapellos and looping and all these other things? I mean, obviously, you've invested a lot of time and effort into your own training around those things. But what would you say to teachers that are in that position? They're like, well, I want to teach other styles. I want to offer more multicultural options, technology, things outside. But I feel like pressured that I've got to stick to these standards, and I don't have a t you know these traditional orchestra standards, and I don't have the time to go beyond it. What would you say to them? Well, I think I would have to convince them the same thing that you convinced of me, which is this <laughs> idea that you can learn technique while being creative at the same time. Mm. And Chris, I. I mean, even up to two or three years ago, I had heard that from you for years, and I just poo-pooed it, as many, I'm sure many, you know, classical musicians uh, would, this idea. But I remember it clicked for me just a couple of years ago that almost 100% of my practicing now is, is improvisation with a focus on a technique. And I, I guess in some ways, teachers and musicians alike would have to just sort of trust you on that and try it enough. Uh, but they also need, you know, they need some guidance, of course, to what does that really look like? But I, I truly believe wholeheartedly now that scales, you know, the way that scales are traditionally taught in schools are, are you know, either unison playing or playing in rounds. And it's, you know, root to root, back and forth. That's just how it's been when I was a kid. That's how it is now. And if you really look at you know, the science of learning that the next step after you learn, that's really just the very basic step one, right? And for a lot of schools, you get a check when you do that, you know, you, their kids are quizzed on do they know their D major scale and their F major scale. And if they play it from root to root, they get a check, you know, and, and 
So in my sense, you know, I really taking the science of learning seriously, the next step is to use it, mm. right, to use the scale musically. And so you can start with that. You can have on a page, you know, how to play the D major scale or how to play the F major scale. But then that's just a, you know, you've got your canvas or your palette and now let's color with it, you know? And I, I like to think about warm ups or every class, all the things that teachers are already doing, teaching rhythms, teaching techniques like vibrato and shifting and playing in different keys. Once you teach, teach the very basics of it, then you can provide great structures for kids to be creative with those things. Mm. So you've got, in my class, if the kids are learning scales, yes, they'll have their scale packet in front of them where they could see that for an F major scale, they need you know to lower their first finger for a B flat, things like that. You know, They'll have that, but once they play through it up and down, what I would do is either make a loop or easy mode for teachers. I just created a, a Google Doc of a bunch of YouTube already made back background tracks you could you could just search f major you know f major background track in youtube and it would play this really cool you know kind of sparse piano or guitar or maybe light drums or something just create a nice groove for kids to explore using f mm. major and then what? i would that's the term i would use you don't have to say improvise you know, i never got kids mm -hmm. to solo people associate ah. with soloing Ooh. which is not about i think that's what a lot of teachers and students for sure get you know shy away from right. from improvising because it's usually introduced in the context of soloing which it never has to be it could Ooh, just be a part yeah. of your you wow. know and, and i loved the environments of you know creating an environment where you look around the room and yes you've got the f major scale that they've run through from root to root but then you give them five minutes to explore f major and you yeah. go around the room and they're playing it and none of them are, are thinking it about their their the speed with which they're learning either faster or slower than the next person because they're just they're in their own little world they're playing and you know it's really easy to do this with strings maybe not band is a little louder it's harder but with strings you can still hear yourself in a, in a room and you you can you can just kind of be in your own world and i had kids who were taking you know lessons at juilliard over the weekend and they're shredding on cello up and down with the f major scale and then i've i've got other kids that maybe you know are are just really experiencing what it what it feels like to play a b flat you know and <laughs> mm. you know what does it what does it feel like and just very slowly moving their bow and then i could challenge kids if they if they weren't engaged you can challenge them in so many different ways you could say well you could play it in third position you could play you could focus on your vibrato or your bow arm or your posture there's just so many great things of, of ways of incorporating that uh creative expression really in every class every class i believe that's amazing class. yeah and i know that that there's a lot of uh what's the word there's 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 a lot of detailed scaffolding that goes into you know how you make that happen you know that 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 i know that i believe you're aware of and have explored really in depth because you know that's one of the differences or one of the things i really um think is unique about you is that you do have this very um you know you have this education background, you know, you've taught in classrooms for years, even before you were a full time, I think you were probably an assistant teacher, you know, working with a great um, teacher. Um, oh, in Darien, what's what's her name? Why am I spacing? Can you tell remind me of the the teacher, the woman that I came to work Jane with? Jane Minnis. Yeah, Jane Minnis, a very experienced and caring, amazing um in my opinion, uh, pedagogy. I mean, you were kind of working underneath her to some degree in the beginning when I first, you know, when I, when I was introduced to you, I think several years ago. And so you, you have the, the, my point is you have this background in the science of learning, uh, in education, you studied it in school. I don't have that background, right? You know, so I'm coming at it from this other perspective. So I love when I hear you, the way you describe it, um, often comes from that lexicon. And it seems like you're able to uniquely bring these things together uh, because as a teacher, you were kind of bold enough to go after these other ideas. Um, but there's a few things. So I, I just wanted to call out that I think, yeah, because if if a lot of teachers might say, hey, just have them explore in the key of F major. But there's ways to do it right and ways to do it wrong. And, and you I could hear that you were referencing that. But I think some of those details 
that's the reason that people should connect with you. You know, teachers that are working in classrooms and they want to get those details, that scaffolding, you know, they could really, they could really have those nerd out conversations with you about that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I'd be happy to have those conversations with them too, but I think you've got this really deep appreciation for what it is to be a classroom teacher. If you're feeling inspired by Austin's interview, join the club. I've been inspired by Austin for many years as I've known him and watched just how many amazing things he takes on. For every great leader, people that are taking action out there, they seek out support, coaching, community, and that's one of the things that we provide through Creative Strings. The Creative Strings Workshop is a seven-week professional development course for musicians and teachers, and I would love to hear from you if you'd like to explore whether it could be a good fit for you. Simply email me, chris at christianhouse.com. Thanks very much to Electric Violin Shop for supporting the Creative Strings podcast. Electric Violin Shop is not only the best solution for all things electric strings, they are also an employee-owned business. Maybe that's why you're always going to get a human to pick up the phone and answer your questions, no matter how many questions you have when you call Electric Violin Shop during business hours. If you're in the U.S., call Electric Violin Shop at 866-900-8400. That's a toll-free call. 866-900-8400. You can also find them at electricviolinshop.com. Creative string players and teachers depend on Yamaha because Yamaha backs up their electric and acoustic string instrument lines with the best warranties I know of. And they support music educators and associations like American String Teachers Association, events like Suzuki Institutes, school visits around the country, and they support much more in music education. If you're on Facebook and if you're a current or future music educator, Join Yamaha Music Educator Community free. Thanks to everyone at Electric Violin Shop and at Yamaha for supporting Creative Strings Podcast. One of these things is form versus function. I'm not even sure if that's the correct way to apply it, but I, it's part of what I, you know, what you said is like you can do creativity at the same time that you're learning fingerboard geography vibrato and i think there's this common assumption and i've heard people express it like you've got to learn proper technique before you can be creative right that's like a very common i think flawed assumption but also beyond that it's the idea that you can only learn proper technique with classical repertoire <laughs> it's, it's like that i think those are both deeply ingrained and flawed assumptions and, and it's the difference between I think form versus function. It's like tech, good technique can be applied in, and learned in many contexts, in many forms. Um, so I think that's what I hear you speaking to. Um, <clears throat> so this is this is great. So much to go into, but I, I'd like to pivot if it's okay, unless you want to say something more on that. Sure. Well, I couldn't agree more with what you said, and I think that's a, a difficult thing to to break down. It's so ingrained in this in the way that, even the way that teachers, if you study music education, that's kind of the the path that you're on. That's how you're taught to teach, you know, in the traditional music education system. If you think about, uh, you know, my experience learning, and I I had an amazing experience studying music education. I loved my classes. That being said, a lot of them were still kind of preparing you to just do the traditional rehearsal. And mm -hmm. a lot of what music education preparation is a traditional orchestra setting rehearsal. And I think one big aspect that you're bringing up here is that if diversity is an important thing for a classroom, oftentimes it's thought to be diverse by just say if you want to introduce rock or gospel or funk music instead of authentic exposure to that music and authentically learning how gospel funk and rock musicians think about music it's often that it's it's just taught in the same structure of traditional mm. notation right. let's you know practice from measure 1 to measure 8 you know <sighs> all that sort of stuff that you're not going to be able to use that language with a rock or gospel musician for the most part right. 
Right. You know, and and so that so I think that there's I just just to reiterate what you're saying, I think there's a lot of professional development that needs to happen post music education, at least in the programs today for teachers. If they want to learn these things, they they do need to be doing that. And, and I think that public education does provide teachers a lot of opportunities for professional development. It just needs to be viewed as a priority, I think, as a, you know, as opposed to an mm. ancillary extra thing. Well, what if, what if I, going back to what you said, what if, you know, that music, edu that orchestra teaching track in college was reimagined as, you know, music education that happens to be in an orchestra versus orchestral education that happens to be music. I mean, I don't know that I've heard people express it the way you did before, and that actually really resonates with me. It's like, you know, our function is to provide this holistic music education experience for a kid, and we just happen to be doing it in an orchestra. Yes. But, but, but the orchestral aspect of it in some ways is secondary. It, it, you know, it, so if, if they change the track to reflect that, I think it's not just about professional development after college. It's about get that stuff in college, right? You know, it, I mean, I don't know. That's just what comes up for me. I could be wrong. I, I never took that path. And I hear that you're not dissing, you're not dissing the music education path itself. Um, but that's what comes up for me. Yeah, I feel really strongly about that. Because if you think about, you know, if you spend any time in classrooms or in schools and you walk around, you know, you got sixth, seventh and eighth grade US and world history. You know, they're learning about, you know, the Civil War and the Revolutionary War. They're learning about these things very sequentially, right? And if you think about music education, they have this choice of choir, orchestra, general music, very disjoint. So, and I guess this is a good segue too. I mean, first of all, part of what I heard from you is that the reason that you took these bold leaps in your teaching, and, and I mean, I can't, I just want to, like, I've seen it. And we've been talking about this for the last couple of years. You know, I've I've witnessed your journey and it's been amazing. That's why I wanted to have you on here. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about it. Um, and, uh, but what you said in during this was that, you know, the reason you, you kind of took these steps is because, in part, because you wrote down your vision and you took that, that exercise very seriously. And, you know, um, my partner Evan Gregor, we did it. We have a class. I'll link to to some of that stuff that you know in the in the show notes page at uh, at christianhouse dot com or creativestrings dot org. I'll link to that for people. But even if you go through a visioning exercise, <clears throat> even if someone says, you know, okay, what's my vision as a teacher? I want to do all these cool things. Austin Shelso did. <clears throat> There's still going to be a lot of fear for most of us about going into the unknown. I mean, the fact is orchestra teachers, they know what they know. Like they, they learned in an orchestra program, right? They learned just like all of like me, like, I mean, I learned in Suzuki and most of the people that I teach have a similar skills, you know, uh, and similar areas that they don't know, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, unknowns. And so there's that point where we have to go into that unknown and it's really, really scary. And um, that's also one of the things I respect about you so much is because I feel like, you know, in the last six years, seven years, you have pushed through into those unknown territories for yourself. Like you had that music education degree about orchestra, you know, and you had growing up as an orchestra, as a kid who played in orchestra, right? But then you took the leap to go into all these different areas, not only as a teacher, but also as a as a musician, playing fiddle music, playing, you know, um, pop, rock, jazz, many other styles of music, and even <laughs> transitioned into working for yourself full time now, where you're teaching people independently. People can study with you online. They can come to your group classes, and you're touring. You're touring. You just, I mean, I just saw a video you posted with the, the, the great Michael Cleveland the other day. You played a duo with Mike. It's incredible to see what you're doing. So I want you to just speak about that journey of 
pushing through that insecurity for, you know, not only for classroom teachers, but just people out there that might be experiencing that. Because I, I definitely know it's a big part of my journey is, is having insecurities and feeling crippled by them, you know, and it's like judging myself, you know, harshly, you know, and saying negative things about my ability as a player and or as a teacher. I wonder if you'd be willing to speak to that. Sure. Yeah, I would say that the beginning of that journey started with my grandparents actually in high school sending me to camps of different styles of music. You know, I, I did the community orchestra as a kid, but they also sent me to, you know, my freshman year Kent jazz camp in, in Connecticut. And they sent me to uh, Berkeley's week-long summer program where they had teachers from all over the world who some of which didn't even speak English you know that were that were really teaching authentically from from their backgrounds and so I think that that's where this journey started for me and all of those were very uncomfortable they, they're they uncomfortable to be in when you start but every uncomfortable experience you have is a rep a mental rep of it's going to be okay or you can do difficult things you can do uncomfortable things i think that that sort of mental training by doing it often enough there's something to be said for that but in terms of my own journey kind of th through and still engaging with some insecurities around uh, teaching and definitely performing i kind of attribute my journey to two main two main things one is having mentors and teachers and a support system of, of people who can give you the feedback that you need at the right time, people who are going to encourage you, people who are going to believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. You know, those those people for me have been you, Chris, throughout the years, have been people like Andy Reiner and uh, Pete Wernick has been a big part of that. You know, those are the people that are giving me what I need to hear at the right time, not overwhelming me, but but building a sense of self-efficacy, a sense of uh, self-reliance, you know, over time, a long-standing relationship with those sorts of people. I think my family's been a big part of that, you know, having having just, I think in general, what I would say is having a support structure, whether that comes from friends, family, or mentors, or teachers that you specifically search out for, that's a, a big part of it. And for me, it's also in from a musician perspective, it's been my bandmates, people have exposed me to new different kinds of music, uh, different eras of music. You know, my bandmates, I've, I've played in mostly in three different bands, the Angry O'Hara's, On the Trail, the Rock Arts. These are all my really good friends that have encouraged me and and kept me musically sharp. And, you know, my professional journey with them has has helped me kind of steadily grow over time as a musician. Uh, the other big category, I would say, for me, and I think it could be potentially for a lot of people, in building resiliency and, and confronting insecurities, that would be taking health and wellness really seriously. So I, I have been really incredibly serious about mentally and physically preparing myself for both performances and teaching at a high caliber, teaching, you know, as with as much presence and engagement as possible. So that kind of journey started for me when I was in college and I was taking a really heavy course load and it was really uh, mentally challenging to, to stay on it. And that, that's when I, that was the year that I got into intermittent fasting and something called Bulletproof Coffee, which is like a mix of MCT oil and butter. And I did that for nine years. I mean, I still do it on days every day. I would do that because I had a course load where at 8 a.m. class and the first break was 3.30. You know, and I didn't, I wanted to kept going. So I would, I would do this intermittent fasting, this bulletproof coffee thing. And that led to, you know, that became my morning routine through every teaching day. I, I would, you know, I didn't need to take lunch breaks because I would just be, my brain would be, you know, really at it. And, you know, that's not the best thing. I think it's good to socialize and, <laughs> and that sort of thing. I learned that, you know, after being a you know cocky young teacher or whatever, I'm like, I should probably hang out with people. Uh, so I, you know, I don't advocate that, but I think there are ways I think of, of confronting mm insecurities and building resiliency through that. One of the things that came up for me though, about it, as I was hearing you talk about it, just thinking about you is also just your willingness to, to, to call it out. 
<clears throat> I mean, I think a lot of us are, yeah, um, it's maybe, maybe a lot of us feel pressure to be experts, you know, like especially teachers, they, they feel a pressure to be expert at everything and to know everything. And so the idea of even acknowledging that, like, well, I don't know anything about uh, fiddle styles or, you know, how to do this. And even just to, just to express it, like, oh my God, I'm scared of having to learn this new thing or it feels like so much work. And I, I, that's one thing that comes up for me is that you, you have kind of looked those things in the face. I don't know. It reminds me of the 12 step programs. Like the first thing is like acknowledging the problem. I don't know if it's exactly the same, but it's kind of like calling out the thing, calling out the insect, you know, and specifically I, I've felt a need just to, just to talk more openly about the fact that like I've had, you know, insecurities, you know, for decades, I, I feel like I've made a lot of progress on it recently, but I mean, I'm almost, almost 50, but I feel like there was a couple decades where I was, <laughs> you know, really hard on myself and, and, and like for people to know that there's a difference between being quote unquote advanced at something and being accepting of where you're at. Like it's not correlated, you know? So there's like people who operate on a really like genius level in any domain, but they still don't feel like they're, they're good enough for something, you know, and vice versa. There's people that are happy wherever they're at. Like, well, if we think about kids that play music, maybe you see, you probably could speak to this more than I could, but for kids, I'm guessing in a middle school orchestra, you've got some kid that can barely get around on the instrument, but they're having the time of their life. And you have other kids that are, crushing it but they're like i'm not good enough i need to practice harder right you know so um i feel i just i just feel like because i work with so many adults i work with so many teachers that i feel like that's a message that i want listeners to hear that if you're an adult you're not it doesn't make you don't have to know everything and then it's okay to it's it's more healthy to address where you feel insecure and to try to you know i don't know what do you think about that I think it's really complex, Chris. I think the insecurities can come from from all sorts of childhood experiences. You know, even even kids at the middle school age, they can you know you can have kids that were brought up in a just a really healthy and and lucky environment where they they naturally feel confident, and other kids that had just unfortunate things that happened to them, and that happens to everybody. I don't think we have much control over our early childhood experiences. So some people I think are going to have a harder time confronting and dealing with these things than others, just kind of through your, your childhood experience. So I don't mean to, to simplify it in any way, but I, I could say broadly that there are ways for everybody to grow and to, to overcome insecurities. Whether it's harder or takes longer for one person than the next is inconsequential, I think, but it is important to, I think we could make the broad acknowledgement that there are things that we can do to train ourselves or our students to feel more confident, to feel more joy when they play. And, you know, that's, that's a different journey for everybody, but there are, there are ways of doing that. Do you think that, do you suspect that some teachers or were you ever in a position where you felt that your own insecurity as a teacher was holding you back from taking a step into being a better teacher to doing something that you thought, I want to do this for my kids, but I feel so insecure about it. So I'm not going to. Yeah, I think there are there are areas that that I felt that way. I think with with teaching, I've I've always wanted to be a teacher. I've wanted to be a teacher from a really young age, and so I experience a lot less insecurity in my teaching. I I feel really confident as a teacher. I feel like I know what I'm doing. I I feel very strong in that. But but confidence is this weird thing because while I can feel incredibly confident in the classroom teaching all sorts of different styles of music, speaking different musical languages and teaching notation and playing by ear and all these different things. That comes, for me, I, I think comes in some ways naturally, in some ways I'm just really passionate about it. So it becomes really easy uh, for me to do something like that. But everybody has confidence is this weird thing where it doesn't apply to all situations. For me as a performer, I've, I've felt incredible insecurities around that. And I think you know, wherever those in insecurities lie in your life, whether it's about your teaching or your playing or your ability to dance or, you know, <laughs> sing or something, you know, uh, they have to sort of be approached from a more, more directed, not as a, I, I think my failure of thought was to think of confidence as this, as this broad thing that you either have hmm. or you don't. But I'm realizing that you can have confidence and confidence in one situation and not in the other. So we need to learn to address our insecurities and like you said naming them to say that i feel uncomfortable you know in 
a jazz jam or whatever. Mm. Whereas you have a bluegrass jam or whatever. And for teachers, it could be, I feel comfortable teaching notation or teaching how to read rhythm or teaching, you know, how to, or, or running a rehearsal. That's something I feel comfortable and confident with. And that's great. I, but I also feel this insecurity around this sort of thing. And, and in general, I think if we can name those and label them more specifically, then we can address them in a sequential way that allows us to build self-confidence, self-efficacy, you know, over time. Beautiful. So being more specific about the domains that we feel uh, less confident in. I love that. Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> There are a lot of ways that that classroom teachers and also performers, hobbyists, uh, whether hobbyists or um, professionals, can can learn from you right now. Including, well, I guess probably the easiest way is if is if any of them just go to austinshelzo.com, and that's S C E L Z O. It looks like Skelzo, but it's pronounced Shelzo. Austinshelzo.com. And if they can go there, they can see your content library, your blogs, like a lot of free educational material that you that you've done that I absolutely vouch for. Um, but also, you've got you know group classes that you're offering, and you've got specific um, areas that you're focused on helping people with, like fiddle playing and um, and other things. And <clears throat> that's all to say that you made an, what I consider to be a very incredible transition which is from being a full-time classroom teacher to being a full-time working for yourself person, uh, performing and teaching online. And I guess, yeah, why did you decide to stop teaching in the classroom full-time? I mean, I know that you still do clinics in classrooms. And um, in fact, I think that's one of the areas you could uniquely shine is just, you know, helping other classroom teachers in, in as a clinician. but. Why did you decide to stop teaching full time in the classroom and switch into this this new entrepreneurial freelance lifestyle? Well, I, I enjoyed teaching a lot. I I think that had I been in another point in my life, that I I would have likely stayed in that position. I had a lot of support, made great relationships, and I was actually given a lot of freedom in that district to to grow in a lot of ways. But what was happening for me is I was living this sort of double life. I was kind of pouring my heart into soul and soul into teaching, but also being a freelance musician. And I was a member of three different bands that rehearsed late night rehearsals, gigs and recording sessions. They're all late. You know, they start up at different times. And, you know, I tried to sustain that lifestyle as best as I could and, and still give 110% to everything. And it, it sort of worked. But over time, I, I came to terms with it, like those, that double life being in a lot of ways, feeling unsustainable, especially if anything changed. So if I had a wife or kids or a sick relative or anything, something would have to give. And, you know, and I had to confront like, well, would I be willing to give up this stuff that I'm doing outside of school or would I, which one could I do? And and so essentially I was trying to create a lifestyle for myself that would give me the same opportunities to, to teach and, and, give with, I think, you know, educationally in the ways that I, I feel like I have a lot of strengths and ways to offer the world and also kind of give myself a, a, a more reliable structure to do some of these other things I had. And I think COVID for a lot of people gives, you know, gave you some extra introspective time to really think through that. So that, that was something I've been thinking about for a really long time, but it kind of, I think the extra time to think about it, you know, made me or gave me the opportunity to make that final decision. And so now I have this flexibility, which is also this great creative outlet for teaching actually in a way that that can reach and inspire even more people, which is a big part of this too. You mentioned clinics. I'm really excited to, you know, visit schools and and I've I've put all the content that I've used in the past 4 years instead of having like a 6th grade class and a 7th grade library and 8th grade library, I put it all in one. It's this, you know, multi-style diverse string kind of wow. program that's designed to kind of inspire kids. So that's a big part of it too, being able to do, you know, entrepreneurial ventures and, and create a structure where I can, you know, have a bigger impact as well. Yeah. yeah. And well, I know that you were 
thinking entrepreneurially in your work as a classroom teacher as well, because we had conversations about where you were asking me, <laughs> you know, how do I get more sponsors? You know, how do I get just community? And you were saying it wasn't even about getting like, you know, commercial the commercial nature of sponsorships from the community, but you just wanted the community to be involved. You wanted the parents to be involved, and and uh, and so we had a lot of conversations about entrepreneurship, but in the context of being the leader of a classroom mm -hmm. orchestra. You know, how do we get more parents involved? How do we create a, you know, community involvement, get the resources for the orchestra, uh, grow enrollment, you know, make it bigger, you know, make it great. This is, this is all to me kind of entrepreneurial. And so I feel like maybe in some ways that was the groundwork for you to take this step to be like, okay, now I'm going to just go work for myself. It's been great to, to see you go through so many of these things. And, uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, if uh, ASTA, if American String Teachers Association uh, Conference goes live in 2022, hopefully we're going to be there and people can meet you there uh, or in future years. Um, but I know that, I know that they, um, I hope that anybody listening here will, will reach out to you. The best ways for them to do that, besides obviously, again, Austin Shelzo, that's S-C-E-L-Z-O dot com. And by the way, you can go to the show notes page for this for this episode, and I'm going to link to a bunch of Austin's cool stuff there. Just go to christianhouse.com or creativestrengths.org, as always, for all the episodes. But besides that, where would where should people connect with you, Austin? Because I know that you're like an open book, and you just, you're really, at this point in your career, at least, uh, you're just very open to just meeting and connecting and, and helping people. So uh, where where should they find you? Yeah, my website's a great place, but also Facebook and and YouTube. I, I'm I would love to to talk with teachers. So you know, I'd be happy if if anyone were to call me. That's that's cool too. My number is two zero three eight one five nine seven two two. You know, I, I I'm interested. I I educate wait. Let's hear that number again. I love this. You got you got to say the phone number again because so in case they're writing it down. What's your phone oh, number again? <laughs> Yeah, two oh three eight one five nine seven two two. I, I love I just, that, man. I'm really passionate about education. I love talking to people. Chris, being a part of your online programs has connected me to teachers from all over the country. Hmm. And I've really enjoyed, you know, a lot of those sessions I'll follow up by calling these people and just talking about what well, you know, what wow. are you what are you finding success in? What are you struggling with? And those conversations just give me a lot of joy and a lot of uh, feeling of, of purpose and and it's connected to to why I think I'm here you know and so I, I'd be happy to have conversations with people um, but but any of those are are fine you you can find me on on Facebook YouTube you can contact me uh, with my phone or text me or call me whatever's fine that's beautiful that's beautiful yeah and and I appreciate that we've had you know I guess I, maybe it was seven I'm not sure do you remember the first time you came to Columbus for the Creative Strings workshop. I went twice, and I went both years before you went online. Oh, okay. So it was like maybe four years ago that you started coming. Yeah. And uh, it was great that I was able to connect with you at those live events um, and then to continue connecting with you uh, via, you know, our online um, different coaching programs that we're doing Um and uh, and also even before that, in the in the classroom setting, when I came out to work with uh, Jane Minnis and and met you out in Darien, Connecticut, it's just like a really cool that we've have all these points of connection and and that's why I feel informed enough to just say like I just want to acknowledge you for all the things you're doing. It's really super super inspiring. So um, so yeah, everybody, um, please reach out to Austin. Um, go check out his free content at austinshelzo.com, S-C-E-L-Z-O, or just check out the notes here. Um, Austin, man, thank you again for everything you're doing, and thanks for sharing with me today. I appreciate you. Appreciate you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to the Creative Strings podcast. Thanks to Yamaha and Electric Violin Shop for sponsoring today's episode and other episodes of creative strengths podcast to learn more about 
Austin Shelzo. And to reach out to him, I recommend just going to his website. That's austinshelzo.com. The spelling is Austin, like Austin, Texas. Shelzo, S-C-E-L-Z-O. S-C-E-L-Z-O. Looks like Skelzo pronounced Shelzo. austinshelzo.com. I know Austin would love to hear from you. He's got lots of great free resources and ways that you can work with him. And again, if you'd like to be like Austin, if you're feeling inspired by everything that he's doing, which I certainly am, reach out to me to see if Creative Streams Workshop and our other professional development programming could be a good fit for you. Simply email me at chris at christianhouse.com. I'll set up a time we can talk on the phone. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the Creative Strings Podcast on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. Please leave us a review, share the episode, find more at the show notes pages. You can find all this and other free resources like our playlong lesson videos and much more at creativestrings.org or at christianhouse.com. I appreciate you. Hope you're doing well. Look forward to seeing you on the next one.